Okay, so I'm going to go through some limits question for the higher level calculus option. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions from from the, the main syllabus, but it illustrates the idea of, of limits. So here's a question, let f of x equals x cubed. We've got to evaluate this function for h equals 0.1, and then we find the derivative from first principles. Okay, so if we remember in terms of uh, using our functions, so we can substitute our values in for that, so f of 5 plus h, we put 5 plus h instead of x, and that will give us 5 plus h cubed minus 5 cubed all over h. Okay, and then we're evaluating this for 0.1, therefore we put h equals 0.1, and that will give us 76.5. Okay, now the connection with limits hopefully should become clear when we look at the second part because we're going to find the derivative of f of x from first principles. Now the formula for the first principles is this, so the, the differential of f of x is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h take away f of x all over h. So it basically means we see what happens as h gets very very small and again we can do exactly the same method as that last example so we replace uh, f of x with f of x plus h so this becomes x plus h cubed take away x cubed all over h and then the idea is to see well what happens when h becomes closer and closer to zero uh, first things first we can expand out the brackets so we end up with this function here uh, you can see that the x cubed and the x cubes there, they're going to cancel out. So what we end up with is something that looks a bit like this. So we basically end up with a 3xh plus 3x squared plus h squared. And then the last thing we notice is, well, we're, we're seeing what happens when h approaches 0. Well, when h approaches 0, this first term here will be 0 and equally this h squared term will also be 0. So what we're left with is 3x squared, which is, as we should already know, what is the differential of x cubed. Okay, so there we go, that is the method of first principles differentiation and using the idea of limits. Okay, and then one more question just to have a look at from the, the main core syllabus, again using the idea of limits. So we've got a function and we know that it's got both a vertical and a horizontal asymptote. We've got to find the equation of the vertical asymptote and of the horizontal asymptote. Uh, we can use this general idea. For the vertical asymptote, we're basically looking for uh, the denominator, and we're, we're seeing when the denominator, denominator is going to be equal to zero, because obviously you can't divide by zero. And for the horizontal asymptote, again, we're going to use the idea of a limit, and we're basically going to see what happens when x approaches infinity. And that should give us a horizontal asymptote if it exists. So, uh, the first bit, we, we look at the function and we say, well, the denominator is going to be 0. Well, 2x minus 5 is going to be 0 when x is 5 over 2. So, there we go. So, when x is 5 over 2, that would give us a 0 on the bottom. Um, so, that's going to be our first uh, vertical asymptote. And then to find our horizontal asymptote, we do this, we say, well, what's going to happen as x approaches infinity for, for this fraction here? Now, the little trick to, to working these out is to, we find the highest power of x. So in this case, the highest power of x is just x. And we divide every single thing in, in the fraction by that power. So we end up with 3 minus 2 over x over 2 minus 5 over x. We divide every single part of this by x. And then once we've got it looking like that, we can say, well, what happens as x approaches infinity? Well, as x approaches infinity, 2 over x is going to become 0, and 5 over x is also going to become 0, because as we divide by an ever larger number, it's going to get ever smaller. Okay, so we're just left with the 3 over 2, and that will therefore give us our other asymptote. And there we go. We can actually sketch that graph as well and check 
um, that we are correct. So we can see that as uh, we try and divide by 0, that was the line x is 5 over 2, we get this asymptote here. And then the horizontal asymptote, we can see as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we get the function approaching uh, y equals 3 over 2. So we've got the, the horizontal asymptote there. Okay, and then we, we go into one of the actual uh, calculus option questions, which at first glance looks very, very similar to that last question. Um, it's just important to note that now we're looking at a sequence rather than a function. So the sequence will just be a set of terms. It won't be a smooth uh, graph function like the, the last question. Okay, but the first part of the question is actually virtually the same. So show that the sequence converges and then find that limit. Okay, so we actually do exactly the same as this. We want to see what happens as n gets really large. So this fraction looks very similar to the previous fraction. And there we go. So we've got the limit as n approaches infinity. And as before, we know that, well, as we divide by a very large number, we're going to get closer and closer to 0. So the 2 over n and the 1 over n will both end up becoming 0. And as before, we end up with uh, 3 over 2. So we've got exactly the same limit as before. Um, but as I mentioned, just be careful with this. This is a sequence, so this is not a function. Um, and these are the first terms in this sequence. So we've shown that this sequence will converge to this limit here. Okay, so that's the first part. Uh, the second part... Um, looks quite complicated. It says find the least value of the integer n such that the absolute value of un take away l is less than epsilon for all n greater than capital N where epsilon is 0 0.1. Okay, so it looks a very, very complicated question, but if we just try and break it down, it should be okay. The first thing to say is, look, well, that's what we're looking at. We've been told that epsilon is 0 0.1, so that's the value that we put in there. We also know that l is 3 over 2 for the previous question. So again, we can put that, put this in, excuse me. We can put this in as well. So we've got, this is un, and this is the limit, which is 3 over 2, and this is 0 0.1. Okay, so it's already looking a little bit clearer. Uh, we can then simplify this absolute value, and it gives us this uh, thing here. So Already, all we really now need to do is rearrange this to find out what the value of n is. Now, in this particular question, we can notice, well, n is positive integer, and therefore this is always going to be positive. Even if n is 1, this is going to give us a positive answer. So we don't need to actually worry about the absolute value for this question. So we're going to ignore that. And we can just rearrange it to get that. So 7 is less than 0 0.1, bracket 4n minus 2. And we can rearrange, therefore, n is greater than 72 over 4. Therefore, n has to be greater than 18. Okay, the, the very final bit is to notice that we actually need to find the value of n, the capital N. Well, Again, this is where it looks slightly confusing. We want a value. This this number here, n, capital N, has to be, well, the small n has to be greater than this value. Well, we've already shown that little n has to be greater than 18. Therefore, capital N, this kind of boundary, is going to be 18. So, again, it's one of those things that looks kind of complicated at first. Um, but that's, that's the general idea. For the second one, we do exactly the same. So the second one should be a bit simpler. Um, and the only difference is this time we've got a different value for epsilon. So there we go. We're now saying it's less than 0 0.000001. We do exactly the same as before and rearrange it. And we get this value here. So we get n is greater than 175,000. And again, we were looking for this value here, which provided the boundary, and therefore we call this boundary N, capital N, which is 175,000. 
Okay, and then this question carries on, the last part of this question. It then says, for each of these sequences, we need to decide whether or not the sequence converges. Um, for the first one, well, we can say, well, we already know that the, the limit of the sequence un is 3 over 2. And uh, we also know that the limit of uh, 1 over n is going to be 0. So basically, we've got these kind of two sequences almost combined together. So if we think about it, we can say, well, the limit of n approaches infinity of un over n is actually going to be the same as the limit of n approaches infinity, well, because this limit of un became 3 over 2, and it's going to be over n, okay, because that's not changed. And then we say, well, we know what happens when n approaches infinity, because this number here is going to get ever larger, so dividing by an ever larger number, we're going to get closer and closer to 0, and, and therefore the, this limit will be 0, so therefore it does converge. Uh, for the second one, same kind of idea. We know that uh, the limit of un is going to be 3 over 2. So the limit of, of this new function, well, we can just say that we, we know it's going to go to this. Basically, as n approaches infinity, we're going to have 1 over 2 bracket uh, 3 over 2, take away 2. And if we simplify that, we get an answer of 1. Therefore, that also converges. The third one... Uh, for this one, I mean, we later in the course you'll look at kind of alternating series um, and sequences. You don't need to worry too much about it for now, but you can just simply see almost by inspection. Well, what's going to happen as n approaches infinity? Um, un is going to get closer and closer to three over two, and so the minus one to the power n is going to mean that that alternates between positive and negative. Uh, values close to 3 over 2, so obviously that's not going to converge, it's going to keep on kind of flicking between positive and negative values. Okay, and then the last question that we're going to have a look at is this one. Um, g of x is sine x, and it says using the result that as t approaches 0, sine t over t is equal to 1, or otherwise, we're going to calculate the limit x approaches uh, 0, uh, g2x take away g3x over 4x squared. This or otherwise is quite important because it means we could use another method and in I think probably the next video when we're looking at L'Hopital's rule uh, we'll, we'll look at that other possibility um, but for now we'll actually use their suggested method using this result here. So the first thing that we do is simply say well g of 2 of x sorry, g of 2x, we simply put, uh, we replace the x with 2x, and just be careful, that's squaring the whole thing, so it becomes sine 4x squared, and equally replace x with 3x, and again, be careful with the squaring, it becomes 9x squared all over 4x squared. Okay, so that's my first step. And then, I can just split up my limits, because... I can just split this into two separate fractions. So it's basically the same as the limit of sine 4x squared over 4x squared, take away, and then the limit of sine 9x squared over 4x squared. And what I'm trying to think of here is, well, I want to try and get it in this form that I've been given, which is sine t over t. Because I know as soon as I have this limit, I know that the answer is going to be equal to 1. So this is how I'm going to try and do it. This first one's already pretty similar. Um, so I'm going to leave that as it as its own. This one on the bottom, though, I'm going to try and make. I have a nine x squared on the bottom because I've got a nine x squared in terms of the sine. So to do that, well, I've basically uh, timesing by nine over four. Okay, and if you can see that, that will give me the same answer as the previous one. It basically removes the divide by four. And there we, we, we cancel out the nines. Okay, so hopefully you can see that those two are actually the same. Now I've written it in that form there. I'm going to use a little trick um, to do a substitution and say this. Well, I can now say that actually I'm going to say that u is 4x squared. And equally I can say that v is 9x squared. And this isn't going to affect my limits, because I'm now going to have my limits as u approaches it. Because look, as x approaches 0, well, u is also going to approach 0, okay, and equally here, 
as x approaches 0, v is going to approach 0. So I don't need to worry about that. That's changed my limits at all. Um, and that allows me to rewrite it as this. So the limit of u approaching 0 of sine u over u take away 9 fourths of the limit of v approaching 0 of sine v over v. Now, once it's written like this, hopefully you can see the, the connection with the, the hint that we were given earlier. I know that sine u over u, the limit of that is going to equal 1. And I know that sine v over v, the limit of that is going to equal 1. So now I've got it in that form. Hopefully it's much easier for me to deal with. And I can simply say that this is going to be 1 take away 9 over 4 times 1, which is equal to minus 5 over 4. Okay, so there we go, some simple examples, well, not so simple, but some, some uh, basic examples for limits in the high-level calculus option.